Hi, it's Marco from Moves Marketing and PR, the editor of Punchline Magazine, and welcome to Punchline Talks, the business breakfast briefers, where each week I invite a panel of experts to review the morning newspapers, find out what's going on in their own individual business and their own individual business sectors, and finally, what's caught their eye in this week's Punchline. If you like the show, please like, share, and subscribe. And before I introduce the panel, I'd just like to thank our fantastic sponsors, Hayeswoods. Business advisors and accountants. Thanks so much to those guys. Okay, great coffee too. Anyway, let me introduce you to my fantastic panel. We've got David Jackson, managing uh, manager of marketing Cheltenham. We've got Rob Lister, MD of Lister Unified Communications, who employed 35, 35 people in Stonehouse, turnover £6 million. We've got Neil Rickett, CEO of Vasarian. They employ 100 people out there in Forest of Dean with 6.5 million turnover and we've got margaret adiwelli md of hr department cluster welcome guys welcome to punchline talks great to see you all we're just going to run through very very quickly the uh newspaper front covers courtesy of the bbc okay here we go the guardian sunik's wife may have avoided 20 million uk in uk tax the daily mirror we have paid sunik's wife for 50 million the Times, Sunak fears revelations over wife are a hit job. You can see a theme coming here, can't you? The Daily Telegraph, Sunak's allies claim number 10 is undermining the Chancellor. The Sun, Rushi, lay off my missus. The I, Sunak vetoed extra help on energy bills. The Daily Express, not another energy bill shock. And it's good to see Tiger back there as well. The Daily Mail, Javid NHS must protect wards for women only. Human rights prior, the UN finally acts against Russia. The Financial Times, the one that really caught my eye actually was, never mind the headlines here, but it's further down, half of all new cars sold must be fully electric in six, six years, ministers say. And the Daily Stars, plea over our crisps panic. Pack it in as shoppers strip the shelves. Basically, they're going to change the recipe of our crisps. There we go. Massive prospect of World War Three. And we're worried about our crisps. Don't you just love it? Love it, love it, love it. Right, let's start with you today, Rob. Thanks ever so much for joining us. Great to see you again. What have you picked out for us? Um, well, as with, you know, the front pages of all the news, you know, Rishi, lay off my missus in the sun, their take on it. I mean, reading all those papers, it's big news at the moment. It's front page. Everywhere. There's lots and lots of different takes on it. Lots and lots of different angles coming into this story from whether it's a hatchet job from number 10 to discredit Rishi's attempt to become our new prime minister to, you know, the opposition having a free run at it. But, you know, some of the underlying bits to me are, you know, is it fair to be attacking the partners who don't live in the public eye of, you know, of people? We, you know, go back to the Oscars last weekend, and Will Smith defended his wife, you know, in a fairly lively format. Richie's finding himself having to defend his wife here. And, you know, is it really fair game to go after, you know, the families and extensions of people in the public eye? Now, I know, understand Richie's in a very powerful position and is impacting on taxes across the country. But I don't know, it just doesn't sit very well with me. And, you know, and underlying that, whether or not she's paying all the taxes she should, she's still paying an incredible amount of taxes to the do, do you think that? You know, relative to all of us humble, slightly more humble people. Rob, do you think that this is revenge by number 10? Because let's be honest, when 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 old Boris was getting spanked for party gate and all that kind of stuff, Rishi didn't really rush to his defence, did he? Now, is it time for Boris's crew to get the knives out and stick it deep into him? Do you reckon that's what's happening? I will. I, politics moves in so many mysterious ways. I, you wouldn't rule it out, but who am I to say? I'm, I'm, I'm going to go quickly around the room. Neil, yeah. what do you reckon? Is, is it Boris? Boris's I, boys bullying him back? I, I don't. I honestly don't know. It could be the Russians. It could be anybody. You know. <laughs> let's face it. I mean, um, you know, is there any truth in it? I, I, I honestly don't know. I'm not in a position to be able to really tell. Am I interested? I'm not really interested, to be honest. If he's done something wrong then that's a, a legal thing for, for people to sort out. Um, 
what I am interested in is the short term nature of politics. Last year, Rishi couldn't do anything wrong. This year, you know, he's he's in the spotlight. Uh, we've had the same with Johnson. We've had the same with Keir Starmer. I, I think if we put as much effort into actually supporting our politicians, sometimes as we do in actually destroying their um, uh, their uh, kind of uh, careers, then I think the country would be in a much better position. Uh, uh, this short term bickering. I mean, I have a big problem anyway with the confrontational nature of politics. We don't have the uh, the collaboration and the cross-party thinking that uh, nations like Singapore have, and and therefore we we uh, we find it hard to come up with long-term strategies. No, no, I totally agree. This very very quickly, David Margaret, what's your take on it? No, I agree with Rob. Um, really, that I think it's wrong for the um, the way that they're focusing on his wife and her earnings, which has nothing to do with politics anyway. So yeah, from, from that point of view, I, I disagree. Where it originally, where the story originally came from, who knows? Um, I guess Rishi has lots of enemies, um, but it sits very uncomfortable with me. I don't like it. Okay, David. Yeah, I, I don't think it's particularly politically driven from within. I think, you know, the Prime Minister's got his own challenges, isn't he? I think without creating more like this, but um, I think it's just one of those sort of fueling the story around the cost of living crisis, isn't it? And sort of, you know, whipping that up a little bit and making the connection there with obviously, you know, his policies around either national insurance or otherwise. And, you know, it, 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 it's obviously putting headlines on the front pages, which, you know, is nice and juicy, which is what the press wants. So, Or well, moving the headlines, moving the narrative away from party gate again. Could be that. And the, and the, and the uh... Anyway, who knows? You, you're right. Anyway, let's go back to you, Rob. Just what I'd ask the question, Rob. What's uh, I've got one last story for us, please. Yeah, it's you know it's a wonderful weekend in sport this weekend. You know the U.S. Masters have started and um, and the Grand National is coming our way on you know tomorrow. You know two evocative and wonderful events for you know many many people. Um, you know starting with the Grand National. You know Rachel Blackmore won last year she's riding the same horse again to defend it she took the season by storm last season at Cheltenham but did it in an empty race course so wonderful to see her win at Cheltenham in front of a packed house and I hope she gets the same chance to enjoy you know the glory in front of a, a crowd on Saturday um I did actually win a couple of quid last year on her by total luck on that race <laughs> um and then the Masters you know it's Tiger Woods is is a legend, obviously, and him coming back uh, over all the adversities, a story in itself. But I think there's also, you know, it takes me back, and I'm sure it takes a lot of us back into our childhood. You know, it was the first great golfing event to be shown on TV. It's the start of the season. You have those beautiful colours and flowers on. And a lot of us remember sort of sitting there with our, you know, with our dads or whatever it is watching it. And and now I find myself doing the same with my son. So it's 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 just a very, very happy event in my life you know so i'm thrilled it's back and hopefully we'll have some great competition over the weekend on that one i just remember sitting on a curb actually outside a betting shop with a bottle of coke and, uh, and a packet of crisps anyway moving, moving i'm just glad you got that the right way around Mark. <laughs> right let's go to you neil neil what have you picked up in the news please actually following on from your story about Chris, i think we're in real trouble uh with food and um you know, uh, shelves have been stripped by people uh, panic buying food. We had the panic buying of the toilet roll. Uh, and if we could panic buy graphene, that would be just fantastic. So there's a massive <laughs> shortage in graphene. But, you know, the, the papers are dominated by obviously the Ukraine and the energy crisis. Uh, I'm kind of curious on people's views around the metaverse, you know, because that is coming for, for the next generation of people coming through. I'm really worried about inflation. There's a story in the sun about... Um, uh, you know, there being a, someone reporting a crime for someone selling a pie and a pint for £17. Uh, if that's the future, I think you might be in trouble there, Mark. I know you like a, a pie. Um, and then, um, you know, sad news in Malaysia about the, the, the divers that have unfortunately died uh, as a result of some kind of mismanagement. But as we you know, take on more holidays, we need to be more careful. Um, you know, we've had a kind of two or three year gap. Uh, and um, we need to be just a little bit cautious. 
obviously massive disruption in the holiday industry at the moment as well uh with um with covid still being there but not necessarily being that well reported um we've had some cases uh, for the first time in two years in our factories we've been very very vigilant uh, about that but you know it is still there and it is still causing disruption and uh, the effects of long covid were being reported uh, i think it was in the times more locally, I'd like to congratulate Roger Deeks for um, becoming uh, Vice Lieutenant of, um, of Gloucestershire, uh, good forest man. Um, you know, huge developments going on at uh, Lydney Harbour and the saga of uh, Graham Wilden and his uh, largest man cave uh, in the country uh, still rumbling on. Uh, that was the local news. OK, thanks. That's a good, good collection there. OK, let's go to you, to you, Margaret. What have you picked out from the papers, please? Um, my story uh, is in the Times. Um, I don't have a hard copy living out in the sticks, so I don't get newspapers. But I just like, it's about Unite HQ, uh, raided by police investigating fraud claims. So that's a um, story for me, because as we know, um, Unite are huge. They support um, employees up and down the country. So it's just interesting to see that nothing's been claimed as yet. I understand nothing's been proven, but they've just raided the um, uh, office. And um, apparently there is um, an unnamed employee involved. But again, at the moment, we don't know anything more. But it's still quite shocking because they're huge. And as we know, they support Labour. So, um, uh, yeah, so watch this space. Okay, great. And the other story I thought was interesting, we all, we've all heard about the trans transgender um, news in sport um, and how it's going to affect women's sport in particular, but now there's an issue about it in the Times about um, women-only wards, um, and so there's concern there about uh, protecting women, so it's all getting very complicated. So it will be interesting to see where that goes um, a, in the future. A, as a HR specialist, are, are you coming across more and more problems with this in the workplace? The only problem, obviously, for, for the workplace is where you have large office complex and you've got male changing rooms and female changing rooms. Um, and there's a question of where they go, but a lot of companies are adapting now and they're just converting all the um, cubicles to unisex. Um, and perhaps that, that is the way of dealing with it, but it doesn't really affect us in the workplace as much. It's really outside, like in sport, um, in changing rooms, in shops. Um, it's a difficult one. So who knows where this is gonna go? Nobody wants to discriminate, but how do you deal with it? Okay, thanks so much. Okay, David, what have you picked out for us today, please? Great to have you on the show, by the way. Thanks for stepping in at the last minute. Yeah, no worries. No, glad to be here. Um, so I've got a couple of things that came up in the the eye this morning um, in the business section. So I, a bit, you know, playing on the theme about consumer confidence, really, and where things are going, spend sort of footfall wise, and, and obviously very close to home in terms of what what I do and what we do here in in marketing Cheltenham. So. Yeah, British Retail Consortium reporting that, you know, certainly March this year was the first sort of almost restriction free month really for two years. So, you know, those figures um, are certainly seeing sort of positive rebound in terms of footfall. Um, although I think the big the bigger story is that it's still, I think, say 17.8% down on high street footfall um, compared to pre-pandemic levels. So, you know, we're obviously still not out of the woods yet. And, and but having said that, you know, at a local level, I know these isn't, these aren't necessarily par for course across Gloucester and other areas, but certainly Cheltenham seems to be bucking the trend. I think we're, you know, we've, we've seen sort of double double digit um, growth even compared to 2019 figures just recently. So, you know, hopefully Touchwood things are on 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 the right track. But, um, but I think, you know, again, the underlying story is, well, actually, what about sales? You know, what about uh, what's actually going through the tills? And, um, although they're, they're saying that in-store sales are, have seen month-on-month -month growth for, I think, 12, 13 months in a row now, um, it's, it's slightly fueled by a lot of borrowing and, and it's probably sort of uh, hiding a lot of, a lot of ills and a lot of pain perhaps still to come. So I think, I think the jury's still out, but you know, clearly there's some positivity in the market um, in the direction it's going in. And, and you know, let's hope that uh, 
you know, the signs that we've seen in Cheltenham, you know, we've got brewery quarter pretty much full for the first time ever, and, you know, not just pre-pandemic level, but, you know, ever. Um, and the prom certainly coming back on form a little bit more. So, you know, I think it's, it's generally as positive as we can be, but, you know, let's not get uh, uh, get over excited too soon because, you know, obviously there's going to be some pain to come in terms of cost of living, et cetera. Um, I think, I mean, elsewhere, there's um, uh, some positive, again, previewing in the Times today, previewing the Sunday Times, best place to live, uh, uh, which obviously is this time of year each year. Um, but it's, uh, Gloucester, well, Gloucestershire as a whole, in the southwest at least, has got two. Uh, so Stroud, of course, as you'd expect, uh, which seems to be in most um, best places to live charts these days. Um, but also Charlton Kings. Um, um, they've actually specified Charlton Kings rather than than Cheltenham itself. So um, again, another nice boost there and recognition for you know the area generally. And, and I think recognition that you know they said it's now the tenth year. And um, so when we launched the inaugural list, it was all about schools and smart supermarkets. London's gravitational pull was, was strong, and the working from home revolution had not reached our door, doorstep. Uh, and high streets were stacked with chains. These days, there's more mention of festivals, bookshops, markets, living car-free, wild swimming spots, and energetic communities who will stop stop at nothing to improve where they live. So I think, you know, what that reflects, actually, is we've got a bit of both of those in, in Gloucestershire and, you know, Cheltenham, Stroud, et cetera, have got, um, you know, a mix of that sort of educational offer and, and high street, as well as, you know, some of those independent vibes and festivals and cultures. So, you know, great positive signs, hopefully, that, um, you know, people will be uh, you know, coming in and, and making their livings and uh, making their lives in Gloucestershire, hopefully. No, no, thanks so much, Mr. David. And as we've been going around delivering our latest edition of Punchline, I must admit, you know, I haven't been out to lots of the high streets as much as I, like yesterday we were at Nails, we were at Sciences, Tetbury, and it was really, really busy, and there was a real vibe about it. And uh, I was actually pleasantly surprised how many of the shops were full and vibrant, uh, and how many new businesses have been set up. Yes, some of the old ones have gone, but they've been replaced by new companies. The shops are being stripped out. Other people are going in. Um, there's a there's a sad sadness to that as well as you lose old old businesses. You know you see there's a, a failure. They always get quite upset when people I I've known over a number of years and suddenly their shop's not there anymore. And uh, you know behind it is behind every blank canvas, shall we say, is a is a is a face of a business person or a family or or even a marriage. You never know with these sorts of things. It can get quite quite deep. Anyway, let's not get to that, but that's a real positive story of the day. I tried to drag it down as much as I could, but no, there's some good vibe out there. Talk about good vibes. Let's go over to Bob Lister. Hey, Rob, let's let's Hi. talk about um, uh, the the big switch off. Okay, I mean, so a few years ago, BT announced that they're going to move us to a totally IP and internet based phone line phone service and have set the date of 2025 um, to turn off PSDN or analog phone lines and ISDN or digital phone lines as they're known and move us all to internet based services. Um, and in touch with anyone who's using old ADSL broadband or even the fiber to the cabinet broadband, those are no longer to work in 2025. And, and whilst 2025 seems a, a long time away, these things have a real habit of running up rushing up on us you know largely because it's it's one of those subjects it isn't very interesting so we just leave it in the background and ignore it and we'll do it some other time but we just know there is going to be an utter car crash at the closer we get to that because there won't be engineers there won't be resources there won't be equipment and all the rest of it so we're doing our very best at the moment to get that message out if you're using analog or you're using ISDN lines or you've got old broadband, it is time to change, get ahead of the curve, get in there now and, you know, get it changed. Um, ideally with us, of course, but that's by the by. <laughs> but, you know, this is going to have a big impact on the way we do it and it makes the country and the way we communicate fit for purpose going forward. You know, there are a couple of underlying issues which we're seeing, you know, certainly for some of the older the older people in the community, you know, who are still, or, or people living in rural areas who are struggling to get those types of services. Um, it can have it can have an impact, but nevertheless, you know, we're just trying to get the message out, get ahead of the curve now, get yourself on the right phone lines and the right internet access um, so that you're not left in a, in a precarious position as the, you know, as we hit that, get closer and closer to that date. 
so yeah so that that's got you know our big push at the moment the other one is still you know the work from home and scenarios and keeping getting people or getting people better at being able to work from home albeit in probably the newer format of not two or three days a week as opposed to the five days a week it was before um and so yeah lot, lots and lots going on thanks mark okay thanks very much for that rob okay let's go to you neil neil so Viserion, last time we spoke i was actually at your factory there where you were you know pouring concrete you had your robot there it was very very exciting what's what's going on now at Viserion? Yeah. Uh, really more of the same. We're concentrating on the textiles, so working with, uh, you know, a uh, whole range of different companies. Uh, yesterday, we, well, yesterday or the day before, we launched our white paper about textiles and how graphene could revolutionise, uh, um, you know, the textile industry, give it better products, longer lasting products, more sustainable products. I mean, it's quite staggering when you think that five gallons of water is used to make a plain white T-shirt. Um, you know, when you scale that up against you know, a 75 pence Primark um, T-shirt, then, you know, you can see that it's just not sustainable. Uh, and so um, lots of activity in, in that area. We're starting to see that um, a lot of the stuff that's been kind of held up by COVID is starting to be released now. Uh, I think um, there's some general concerns about uh government spending um you know what is going to happen moving forward uh, there was a uh, the uh, ati the aerospace technology initiative you know they received uh, their funding the other day 640 million pounds which is a record amount for them i believe uh, and so you know there are areas in which um you know there's huge amounts of development and the government have obviously bought into uh, advanced materials so for us that's really positive uh Kind of concerned a little bit about you know inflation as i said before and and, and energy prices for industry in general not not necessarily for this area but um you know that those are going to be big challenges to overcome but you know we're great at doing that we're great at overcoming uh, those challenges and um and launching new products so for, for this area it's all about graphene enhanced products and getting those to market whether that be concrete textiles aerospace automotive or any of the other industries in which we're working I mean, the aerospace industry has really picked up again. I mean, uh, and obviously the government have just announced that Boris was waving the flag for five new nuclear power plants. Hopefully they might be, um, you know, put a little bit of graphene in there in the concrete. We're going to make five, you know, wh where's all this concrete going to come from? Well, you know, the answer is to use less of it, but to use it in a much more efficient fashion, which is what we're campaigning with uh, or lobbying government with, you know. So if you've got a finite capacity, but you need more and more of it, then it makes sense to, to come up with ways of making that concrete go further. Um, you know, there's a whole range of different programs that we're involved in, everything from HS2 to roads. Um, but yesterday's conversations with um, so, some guys from the Graphene flagship was about space, you know, so... You know, that's going to be big in terms of uh, Rob's demands for communication. We need more satellites. Uh, we're very hungry around data. Uh, and so, you know, communications is uh, it's another big area that has lots of challenges. Uh, and generally, you know, devices, you know, I was talking before I came on this call with our guys in South Korea. Yeah, they've got a different set of problems in South Korea. They're looking at uh, a handset technology. They're looking at display technology. They're looking at the, the very high end of uh, graphic technology. Uh, and so, you know, we, we all want better devices long, you know, that last longer. And that's the area in which we're, we're heavily involved. Okay. Thanks so much, Neil. Always, always, always so exciting for catching up with you for what's actually happening in this area. And really flying for the flag for the Forest of Dean there as well. Anyway, okay, let's go to Margaret. Margaret, okay, yeah, HR, I mean, goodness gracious, the, the problems about people going back to work, co-working, all this sort of, sort of stuff. You work with lots and lots of different businesses, uh, uh, HR department. What's the, what's the biggest issue you're finding at the moment? Um, for me, I have watched um, since COVID when we were all in lockdown and the the change in the mindset of both companies and employees, um, particularly with regard to home working. We all started, oh, it's a good thing, it's here to stay, never going to change, everybody was loving it. And then we've all gone back to work or try to get back to work and the feelings have shifted, which is quite interesting. And now companies are saying, well, actually, perhaps this isn't such a good idea. 
um, because the law behind home working, although companies don't realize it, it's very complex. There's things companies haven't even begun to think about um, in terms of health and safety. Um, some companies have been great and they've made sure that the employees are okay working from home, but others haven't. They've just said, okay, um, you can work from home, but you know, what about the equipment they've got? Are they safe? What's their um, situation? What about confidentiality? Who's, um, you know, when they're working on their screen, are they taking care um, with the information that they've got on your business? There's so many things to think about and, and companies haven't really dug deep enough, I think. Um, and then there's the other issue where we're starting to think about people perhaps getting people back to work now because we want collaboration, we want to share ideas, we want um, everybody working together, we want, um, you know, some people feeling isolated. So um, there's that side of things as well. So it's all getting um, a little bit complex um, as to how to move forward. But I think give it another five years and I think we're all going to be back to the office. That's, that's very interesting, yeah. And uh, it, it's it's a it's a funny thing because I can imagine people um, not ha not sitting at the right desk, they crouched over or sitting in bed on their their laptop or over a kitchen table. I'm very comfy here. I've got a very nice office. My 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 colleagues who all work from home, they they've all got their own offices as well. Um, but yeah, there's lots of people that haven't. They probably haven't got the right chair. They probably oh, yeah. over. There's I, lots of stuff like that, isn't it? Yeah, I speak to people and they've got they don't have their background on and they're in their bedroom perched on the end of their bed trying to work. So um, yeah, you know, there's all things like this going on, and it's not. Although you know they're quite happy to do it, it's not good long term to be working that way. It okay. will have impacts on their back, their health, and so you're going to see a lot of rising claims to employers. Oh, I've got back problems, wrist problems, um, mental problems, um, and you know, are all things in the future employees will have to address. So what sort, of, what sort of things should they be putting in then, companies? What sort of safeguards? Well, they just need to make sure that if you, you want to work from home, you've got the right equipment, um, that you're working in a safe manner, that yes. um, you adhere to confidentiality, that um, home means your home address, not in Spain or somewhere else, which you have no jurisdiction over if anything goes wrong. So, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of things to think about. And also, if that person is working abroad, what are the laws, employment laws for that country that they're working in? So um, you, you need to write things into your um, contracts that, you know, that will protect you as a business. OK, thanks so much, Margaret. OK, I'm going to go over to David, because I know that, David, I should have done you first, really, maybe, because you've got to get the wrong way around. Yeah, right. Thanks so much for that, Margaret. OK, David, uh, there's a couple of stories, uh, a couple of things, really, I wanted to touch on you. First of all, was the Cheltenham and Gloucester announced a new marketing campaign. Can you tell us about that, please, mate? Yeah, yeah, no, it's a it's a pretty positive one, really. We um, um, visit England, the National Tourist Board, as um, many people will know, um, I mean, obviously, government funded so they, they put a, a prize fund in place of around a million quid and, and offered it to the UK wide and uh, to say look you know um, put in a bid for for the best you know kind of campaigns you can put forward to try and encourage visitors around the UK and to discover more urban destinations I have to say so cities and towns um, so uh, myself and uh, uh, my colleague Rebecca Clay over in Visit Gloucester we put our heads together and thought okay well look, there's, a, there's an opportunity here for Cheltenham and Gloucester we you know, we work closely anyway, but certainly not on this scale. So, um, yeah, we we put a bid in, and we have just come out with um, just shy of a hundred grand, which is um, which is better than a poke in the eye, and uh, uh, you know certainly you know means our pockets are a bit deeper all of a sudden, and um, we're going to be able to run a campaign over the next two or three months, which will get pre-nesters, so young people in the twenty-five to forty-four age bracket into Cheltenham, into Gloucester. You know, just as things start to come back on stream and all the festivals, tall ships, jazz festivals, music festivals, etc., are all taking place and things come alive again. So, um, yeah, we're one of um, one of only 10 places around the country to get it. So um, we're very pleased and, um, yeah, sort of working busy behind the scenes to pull together the, hopefully the best campaign we've seen in the, in the region for a while. And, and hopefully that campaign is going to be spent on, on very local media. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Always, always. Yeah. No. I've got to pitch it where you've got a chance, isn't it, guys? <laughs> OK, well, I won't try you down for that at uh, this particular moment. Anyway, you've got also this visitor information pod just arrived in Cheltenham. 
Mm. Yeah, again, I mean, it, it all coming together at the same time. So much like I was saying earlier about the sort of return to, to football and sort of people coming back onto the streets. Um, you know, as many people know, the Wilson Gallery, Art Gallery in, in Cheltenham has been closed since the pandemic, actually, or before the pandemic, it's been now undergoing quite a major refurb. Um, so we've been bereft and, and without a, an information centre, for want of a better word, for the last couple of years. And obviously lots of people are coming back into town. We normally get two, two and a half million visitors in Cheltenham every year. And, um, um, you know, we know that therefore there's a lack of that kind of provision for yeah, even just basic, whether it's directions or advice or recommendations or what to do. And, you know, because of all those events and festivals that are coming back on stream and, you know, fantastic programming at the theatres and things like that, you know, we've got a lot of people coming into town that perhaps just don't realise things are going on. And um, and the idea of it being right slap bang in the town centre, right in the high street means that, you know, you don't know what you don't know. So actually passing that, you know, big digital screens, telling people what's going on this week and this, you know, today if they're here, um, just hopefully might prompt and, and influence a few people to say, do you know what, I'm going to stay a little bit longer this evening or I'm going to go out this evening and I'm going to go and grab a ticket for the theatre or plan to do something at the weekend which I didn't realise was on so yeah it's a pilot for the next three months so we'll see how it goes but um, you know we're hoping it'll work and it'll become a, a kind of permanent fixture and something perhaps we can do elsewhere as well. Yeah I think it's a great idea and I can imagine something like that in Gloucester and you're right you don't know what you don't know especially in your local local area. Um, the other thing I've got to ask you before you go as well and that leads on to before you go there, there's a there's an advert actually in the uh, online from Cheltenham Borough Council, advertising for new marketing destination manager at Cheltenham. That's not you, is it, mate? <laughs> I wish you could have, yeah, break it to me gently. Um, no, it, it is me, it is my role, yeah. Though um, I'm departing for uh, Pastures New in, in June, so I'm, I'm heading up to um, up to Scotland, actually, visit Scotland to be regional director up there. So, um, yeah, the job, I mean, joking aside, the job, it's a really, really fantastic job, you know, and, and it's been tweaked a little bit to be a bit more broader. You know, place marketing, inward investment, economic development. So, you know, I think we all know, you know, what's going on in Cheltenham at the moment. Huge opportunity, huge change. You know, all the things around cyber, Golden Valley. Um, you know, massive opportunity for the town to really kind of, you know, once in a lifetime opportunity, really. So, you know, somebody to come in and, and grab that and embrace that and roll with it and kind of develop that brand and that narrative and that identity for Cheltenham, not just regionally but nationally, internationally as well. You know, huge opportunity. So, um, yeah, jobs, jobs, jobs out there. The next couple of weeks. So, um, um, you know, get in touch, please do, because uh, yeah, great opportunity. But I think John, John, we really miss you, mate. I think you've done a fantastic job. And I know we first met. You came from the Silly Isles. You did a great job over there, uh, and here as well. And, and what is the role in Cheltenham, in sort of Scotland for you? What will, will you be doing over there? Yeah, so it's, it's going to be um, regional director up in the sort of north northeast of, of, of Scotland. So uh, working for the National Tourist Board. So um, I'll be based up in Aberdeen, actually. So, um, um, uh, yeah, bit of a, bit of a, all the way from the southwest to all the way in the northeast. But, um, um, yeah, good opportunity. Great you know, lifestyle change for the family as well. And yeah, we've, we've, we've missed the coast. We've missed the sea being on a tiny island for five years. And, uh, you yeah, this will give us the best of both worlds, really. So, um, yeah, looking forward to it. And, and of course, you might need to advertise you know, Scotland, down to a local media down here in Gloucestershire. Mm -hmm. Just keep us in mind. <laughs> There's always an opportunity. Well, David, I just want to say, uh, you know, thanks ever so much as well. For, I think you've done a great job, mate. Really, really have. So, uh, uh, and all the very best. Hopefully I'll speak to you before you go. Anyway, guys, we've got to crack on. So uh, what is the story that's caught your eye in this week's punchline? Rob, starting with you, please. Well, first of all, I just want to say well done, Mark, getting the magazine back out again. You know, I, I'm a big fan of hard copy at my age. Um, obviously, the story of the week is definitely the one about me. No. <laughs> um, the one that caught my eye was the one about Kitchen Garden Foods, another Stroud-based company. Um, you know, and a shout out. So it's a shout out for a company in Stroud. But the story is about their roller coaster ride from starting, you know, going through the pandemic, coming out the other side now, probably stronger than they are. Um, I remember watching James Harwood on one of your, you know, interviews a, a year ago or so, and, you know, came across as a really colourful guy, funny guy. And you can see that in the branding with his foods, but it's Wolfies and NAF foods, you know. It's, it's got all the right messages for me. It's made with natural ingredients. It's made in Stroud. <laughs> um, and, you know, they, they just seem to be doing a great job. So that's the one that caught my eye. No, great stuff and great company. You are right. And real nice guy as well. I really enjoyed the big interview there with him. Okay, Neil, what's caught your eye? 
so it was the half million jobs at risk as small businesses face double whammy of costs. Uh, research predicts 19,000 businesses are likely to fail by 2024, highest number of corporate insolvencies. I just wanted to say, if you are running a business, there is help out there. Uh, there are, you know, people to talk to, uh, you know, please go and see the growth hub. Uh, we now have regional growth hubs, so that there shouldn't be any reason why they're not within, uh, you know, a, a decent distance of you. Uh, tough times, but there is help. So, um, uh, you know, GFIRST ADP has set up a great network of uh, business navigators and advisors to be able to, to help you. So that was, that was my takeaway there, Mark. Okay, thanks very much. And finally, Margaret? What's caught your eye on this week's punch? Just a couple of nice things, really. Um, Day of Entertainment to launch King Square. Um, as you know, there's been a lot of development in that particular part of Gloucester. And um, of what they've done is really looking good. And um, they, they're just going to have a day where they launch it. And it's going to be very entertaining. So it's going to be good because hopefully it's going to bring lots of people into the area, um, which is always good. I think Gloucester sometimes is a poor relation to Cheltenham. So it's nice to get their own little bit of publicity sometimes. So I think I thought that was really nice. And the wow. other thing was about the Tour of Britain. Uh, that's going to be based in Gloucestershire. Again, that's fantastic news for the area because um, they're going to focus on um, the whole of the Cotswolds. But part of the tour is going to go through um, Gloucester Cathedral which is really, really beautiful. And I think it's very, um, a lot of people aren't aware that it exists. Um, and it's a beautiful place to go and have a look around. So, um, so that's good news as well. And then they're going to end up in the docks. So, yeah, so I think, you know, it is, summer is looking good for um, Gloucester. So yeah, excellent. <laughs> okay, thanks very much, Margaret. It, it is the story of the week for me, actually. Gloucestershire's first ever full stage of the Tour of Britain. Very exciting. Cheeks three, the Cotswolds, and the finish line of the historic Gloucester Docks. That's all we've got time for today. Thanks ever so much for, to my fantastic panel. Thanks for our sponsors of Hazelwood. Thanks ever so much, guys, from them as well. And if you enjoy the show, please like, share, and subscribe. And we'll see you again next week. Thanks for talking to Punchline Talks. Bye. Bye. Bye.